Okay, so. Cool. Thank you so much for stopping by and uh, joining us with this year's 2023 International Euphonium Summit. I have a special guest uh, artist with us, uh, Dr. Jamie Lipton uh, from Henderson State University. Uh, amazing, amazing euphonium artist. Uh, check her bio in the links below. If uh, you know her, shout out to where you're from. Uh, stopping in from listening on any of the media content we have posted. Uh, welcome, Dr. Jamie Lipton. Um, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Uh, so as this has progressed, it's it's been really uh, amazing and refreshing to see euphonium artists uh, take uh, take this mantle in recollecting the, your past and to helping those current and future euphonium artists, wherever they are and their parents, understand uh, the framework and perhaps even hearing you know, your parents take on what it meant for you and how, how they supported you and how they continue to support you now as we um, go throughout these series with you and with these short little snippets and chapters of your life, I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, no problem. So with that being said, what age did you start with euphonium? Um, in, I'm from Illinois. And at the time, I believe Illinois started in fourth grade. Uh, my first band experience, I think it was on Friday mornings before school, uh, with full band and one director. That was all we got. There weren't any instrument specific classes. Our instruction just took place in one giant band outside of school hours, uh, which is not an ideal way to learn anything. Uh, and I come from a really good school district. So I think they were just, you know, figuring some stuff out back then. I'm sure it's much more streamlined and organized now. Um, and uh, the uh, director there, if uh, he may have retired, but he was very, very good after the, uh, the, but that was not the director that started me. Um, the director that started me was a woman who played flute and she, um, she had some really old school ideas as many teachers did in the early nineties, uh, about who should play which instruments. And so I remember we got, we got all the instruments were demonstrated to us. Um, is, is this the kind of content you're looking for? Yes. Precisely. Okay. So I don't know if you want me to tell funny stories or what, yes, but um, everything. Okay. So, uh, I remember they had like, uh, like seventh grade band kids demonstrate their instruments for like the, the fourth graders. And so we were, we saw all the instruments and then we got to choose. And I remember we had a slip with four lines on it. We were supposed to write our top four choices. And when I, when me and my friends decided we were going to play in band for some reason, I was just really attracted to the idea of playing a big instrument and a loud instrument. Um, and so, my first choice was trombone and that was what I wanted to try. Um, that was, that was my very first choice forever. I don't know if it was like the music man, 76 trombones. I knew that song at that point, but, um, I really wanted to play trombone. And my director said, you won't be a good trombone player. Your arms aren't long enough, which is actually still the case. <laughs> I can't reach seventh position very well. Uh, I need one of those extend a bone things, but, um, but, uh, so I was not allowed to play trombone. For, for being too short, which is not a good reason for the record to not play an instrument. There are things that can help you play the trombone if you um, are short, or even if like you you don't have a hand, you know, there's, there's devices that will, that make the trombone more accessible to people, but not back in 1990. So um, my second choice, uh, so I, I put trombone as my first choice, even though I knew my band director wasn't going to let me do that. My second choice was tuba. Uh, and the band director said tubas for boys. So she wasn't going to put me on tuba, but I put it anyway. Of course, tuba is not for boys, tuba is for everybody. But I was, um, that was why I did not end up playing tuba. The third thing I wrote was baritone. And I remembered from the demonstrations that it was big, but I couldn't remember quite what it was. So I put that was my third choice. And then my fourth choice was tenor sax. Uh, cause that was the, the biggest woodwind instrument that anyone had demonstrated. And so I was like, I guess I could play that too. So at the instrument handing out ceremony, they said my name and they said, Jamie Lipton will be playing baritone. And I remember after the ceremony, I went up to the band director and I'm like, can you remind me what the baritone was again? Cause I kind of forgot. 
So um, I got my first baritone. It was all nasty and it had holes in it. It was all rusted. Oh it was probably from the 60s or, you know, I just it was 1990. It was probably older than that. Um, and just had one of those bell front ones that, you know, we used to march with mm -hmm. uh, before they came up with the bugle style ones. And um, I met like my friends were standing around me when I opened it and they all have new shiny instruments that came from the rental store, but mine was owned by the school. And I opened it and my friends were like, oh, Jamie, I'm so sorry. And <laughs> I just remember they were, they felt that really bad smell? for me. My, my instrument was, yeah, it smelled, you know, it had that school instrument smell, you remember. Um, and so, uh, so I played it and I don't really, I was not good. There were three girls uh, from my class that played euphonium and the, the other two quit very quickly. So it was, I was just the only one left. And it wasn't even that I was super enjoying band. I, was just, I just didn't quit things very easily. And so I just kept going. And a lot of my friends were going too. Uh, by the time we got to like proper junior high, we did have instrument specific sectionals. And um, I was with the trumpets. And I forgot to mention this, but the uh, the band director that I started with, who told me that tubas were for boys, um, made the also made the mistake of letting me choose my own method book. Uh, being a flute player, I don't think she knew what she was doing. So she saw a baritone treble clef and a baritone bass clef method book. And she held them both up to me. And she's like, which one do you want? Now, I had been playing piano for about two years at that point. Uh, but I was a Suzuki piano student. Uh, do you know what that is? Yes, I do. Probably, but, for, yes. But, for, but for our parents and uh, younger artists that don't know what that is, can you describe that for us? Yes. So my earliest, other than like singing a lot, which I really loved. Uh, we'll we'll probably dive into that. Sing, um, but my first experience, uh, with instrumental music was with piano. I was about eight years old when my parents enrolled me in piano lessons and, uh, they put me with a Suzuki teacher who had been recommended by some family friends whose children were already studying with her. Um, I think she was very good and very reputable. The Suzuki method is all about playing by ear. And so, um, I, she would give me what we, what we called an endless tape. It was a tape of the music that would just play all night. You didn't have to turn it over. And so I would fall asleep to that tape every night. Um, and uh, of, of all of the Suzuki book one pieces, you know. Okay, so and, let, let uh, me, I'm going to stop you right there. A lot of the younger artists don't know what a tape is, unfortunately, I think. Oh, okay. A cassette so, tape. Cassette tape. Yeah. The yes. That you put in. That's what we listened to in the 80s and 90s before CDs made a really big appearance. So that's uh, that's what I did. And um, I got pretty good at it. I played well by ear. Uh, I have a good ear. And um, I uh, it was a long time before I started learning music. But around the time I started playing the baritone, um, I had just been introduced to treble clef. I did not read bass clef at all at that point. And so when my stupid band director let me choose my own method book at the ripe old age of nine, um, I chose the treble clef because that was the clef I was familiar with. And I dug my own grave at that point. So, <laughs> um, so yes, I was a treble clef euphonium player who did not switch from trumpet. I just started on it. Um, and, uh, so, so yeah, I had my sectionals in junior high with the trumpets because I did not read bass clef and I would just copy their fingerings because I didn't learn mine. Uh, I was a very, very bad junior high band member, but, uh, I had a pretty sound and I could read rhythms and, you know, I had good musical fundamental skills from piano. And so my band director uh, was always trying to get me to play solos and stuff. And I'm like, no, I don't want to stuff like that, you know, and I was I was actually going to um, quit bands at the end of junior high because I was uh, way more into choir. However, in the state of Illinois in 1995, when I graduated from junior high, the state legislature passed a law that said if you did marching band at the high school level, you did not have to take P.E. Mm -hmm. And I was nice. very interested in not taking P.E. And so by keeping marching band in my schedule, uh, I didn't have gym, which then freed up that hour to do choir. So I was able to do both. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, there were a couple of semesters in, in high school where I did have to do um, I had to take a P.E. class. And uh, I, so I think I had to take one semester off of choir and I was like really devastated about it because I, I hate gym and I love singing. Uh, but all through college, I did both choir and band. And, cool. uh, and in college, when I went to Northwestern and I wanted to be a band director, but I also didn't want to give up singing. So I actually 
got, um, I did a kind of a double major within uh, education. I did instrumental and choral. Uh, and I did uh, two internships, a band one and a choral one at two different schools. So um, so that's that's basically how I, I got started. I did eventually learn bass clef. Um, awesome. I, not, I started college or what? <laughs> I started trombone in high school. My uh, band director wanted me to do the jazz band. And so I showed up with my euphonium uh, expecting to play a tenor sax part because that's usually what I played. You know, there's a treble clef euphonium and a tenor sax part are usually the same thing uh -huh. in marching band, um, at least high school marching band. And my director's like, nope, you're going to play a trombone part. And I'm like, but those are in bass clef. And he's like, yep, you're going to learn bass clef. And so I did learn bass clef and I learned uh, to play trombone a little bit, not super well, but in high school, I, I did, you know, play well enough to play in our jazz band. Um, and, uh, and that, but then I got to Northwestern and if you know, Rex Martin, he really made fun of me a lot for not being as fluent in bass clef as I probably should have been, especially in sharp keys. And I'd be playing my Roshu, I would be making mistakes everywhere. And he, uh, I remember one time he took a little, like a, a, you know, reading notes primer off of somewhere, you know, it's had all this dust on it. He's like, I don't usually have to give this to students, but I think you might need it. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> no, I, I do read bass clef pretty well now, but, um, I, I think treble clef will always be my stronger one. That's awesome. Cause that's right up the alley of, uh, being in the Athena brass band. Is it not? Yes. Um, uh, I love playing in brass bands. Athena is only one of the ones I play in. The principal one that I play with is natural state in uh, little rock. Uh, we are a second section band at NABA. We've we've also played in the third section. I think we even entered first section one time. So, uh, you, so we just go you, ahead. Can you go into and, and that's uh, we'll dive into really deeper into all this in later minuets. But for now, can you uh, kind of uh, paint that uh, what it means to be in first section, second section, third section in a brass band? Because a lot of Maybe a lot of our viewers, especially in the United States and, you know, euphonium players, uh, these younger euphonium artists don't really understand what that is. Um, OK, so brass bands, these are British style brass bands, but there is also an American brass banding movement and uh, that extends into Canada. So NABA stands for North American Brass Band Association, um, and they have the championships. Uh, once a year, usually in the spring, uh, this year or this this season, they will be in um, Huntsville, Alabama for the third time. And then after that, they happen in three year shifts. So either they'll stick with Huntsville for the next three years or they'll go somewhere else. Um, so brass bands have uh, cornets instead of trumpets. Uh, they have a flugelhorn. They have an E flat cornet, which plays all the high stuff. Um, tenor horns instead of traditional F horns. Uh, baritones and euphoniums next to each other. So they're not interchangeable in a brass band. You've got to say euphonium or baritone, uh, depending on which one you actually mean. There's a few trombones, bass trombone, and usually about four tubas, two of whom play small tubas, usually E flat, and the other two play supposedly B flat tubas, although that's commonly performed on C tuba here in America. Um, so, uh, and then percussion. So that's that's the makeup of a brass band. The important thing is no woodwinds. And so that means all the technical stuff gets spread around all through the brass instruments and the euphonium, which was always relegated to the back row, doubling bassoon or tenor sax or trombone oh, in high school. Now in brass band, we are one of the principal euphonium is one of like the three most important people in the band. We sit right next to the conductor. Um, it is it is really a different experience. And I wish it was one that I had the opportunity to join a brass band in high school and I didn't take it. I was too scared. Um, and so my advice, some of my advice for younger players would be if there is a brass band in your community, find a way to get involved with them. Even if you're not a good enough player that they won't let you play in there yet, see if you can get on the sub list, go to their concerts, get a lesson with the section leader of your section. Um, it's, uh, really the most fun I've ever had playing in a large ensemble has been playing in brass band. So highly recommend. So I know these minuets, I kind of gearing toward 15 to 10 to 15 minutes. I really want to dive into your love of singing, singing going way back. When, when did that start that you noticed? I don't remember when I started singing because uh, it was, it started Young like, age. 
yeah, it, I was, as soon as I could talk, I was singing. Um, my parents, I would play my little cassette tapes cause that's all there was back then. Um, and, uh, I know I had a Care Bears cassette tape where they sang uh-huh. like it was songs from a Care Bear show or uh-huh. something like that. And, and I had them really all memorized school. and I would sing that. I would just scream them in the car. Uh, my parents hated it. My brother really hated it. It was a major sticking point between us for years. Um, but uh, pretty much anywhere they would let me sing, I would sing. Uh, I would sit at all family gatherings. I would sing. And I was uh, really into Broadway musicals. My dad, sometime in like 85 or 86, when I was about four or five years old, took a uh, business trip to London and came back with the newly released Les Miserables album on cassette. And me and my brother both listened to it nonstop. We wore the tapes out. Um, I have, I, to this day, I have every word of Les Miserables memorized. Uh, and I didn't stop there. I just, you know, Phantom of the Opera came out in the late Mm eighties, Miss Saigon came out in the early nineties. I'm pretty sure Rent came out in high school. You remember Rent, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so like, I just, I loved to sing. I did take, um, I, one of my, um, Here's something that you won't hear from too many other euphonium players. My biggest vocal performance as a kid was at my bat mitzvah. Um, and uh, bat mitzvah is something that is um, that Jewish people do to mark the transition to adulthood. For boys, it's called a bar mitzvah. For girls, it's called a bat mitzvah. And for non-binary people, I don't know what they're calling it. I would love to know if anybody can send me that information. Or put it, post it down below. Put it in the comments. Yeah. Because um, I'm sure that's happening now. It didn't in the 90s, but... Um, so I, uh, we had the choice to, to sing our Torah and Haftarah portions. And I absolutely did that. Cause that was the only way I was going to memorize it. I sucked at Hebrew school. Um, and so I, uh, yeah, so I memorized it and I sang it for like the whole community showed up, all my friends, all their parents, all of my whole family, all of my parents' friends and all of the synagogue people. Cause that's who shows up to it. Um, and so everybody heard me sing and everybody loved it because I, I really love to sing. And I was I, for a 12 year old. I've I've watched the video of my bat mitzvah as an adult. Um, and I think I, I did pretty good. All right. There's just some technical problems there that a voice teacher probably could have helped me with. But so I'm it, curious, was, it was pretty solid. Would, if if it's I, I'm I'm assuming it's not posted anywhere. No, it's uh, my mom had it converted to DVD from VHS. Oh, uh, my that's mom cool. Is, uh, my bat mitzvah was in 1993. Right. So, um, so yeah, there is a DVD version of it that my mom owns. Um, but I don't have a copy, no, and it's definitely not on the internet. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> that that was that was going to lead me to another question that I'm not going to ask now. Uh, maybe in future in uh, future conversations. When did you, so? When did you first take that smelly baritone home? I'm curious. Um, well, I. I, I I thought that every school did this, but I realized that in lower income areas that might not be possible. I had my school instrument and my home instrument. Um, wow. And so I always, I was signed out to different uh, instruments. And so one of them stayed at home, one of them stayed at school. I do remember maybe because it was the beginning of the school year or something, I do remember having to lug one of those cases on the bus a few times. Um, but for the most part, I, I didn't have to do that because I had I just had two instruments. And then in high school, I got my I my mom purchased my my first uh, euphonium, which was my Yamaha uh, 642. That was my first personal instrument. Awesome. Um, and uh, I got that my junior year of high school. And so after that, uh, I just I had a gig bag for that. And so I would just carry that one back and forth. And by then I was driving. So it wasn't that big of a deal because I didn't right. have to carry it on the bus. So um so yeah, I didn't I didn't have to worry so much about that. And by the time I got to like proper junior high in fifth grade, uh, which I well, I think most people call that middle school, but my junior high was five through eight. Wow. And at that point, I had um some really nice school instruments. I don't know what they were. I, I wasn't looking that long ago. I I wasn't aware. I it was um I would guess it was Yamaha's. I know I played a Yamaha in high school, a 321. And um and that's why I went with the Yamaha because back then, you know, I wasn't, I was 16. I wasn't about to go to the army conference or iTech and try horns. I was just like, well, let's get the the top Yamaha model. Cause that's what I'm used to. So that's how I ended up with my first horn. And um, I don't remember when I got rid of that nasty euphonium, but I know as the other girls from my, my class that started on baritone dropped out, then I got the nicer instruments. So <laughs> 
uh, I, you know, I didn't have to wait very long until I had my choice of the euphoniums. I'm not sure any of them were very good, but I did, by the time I was in like sixth grade, I know I was playing on nicer instruments. That's amazing. And just to get a framework of lessons wise, when did you first start taking lessons? I had my very first, well, I had piano lessons from the okay, time I was eight. Right, eight. And then uh, I was, um, I had voice lessons at some point in junior high. When I decided I was going to do band in high school, they mailed me my marching music so that I could practice my, over the summer. And all, first of all, all it was, it was in bass clef. And second of all, <laughs> the rhythms were so hard. They were, they're all syncopated rhythms. You know, we're playing, you know, rock music in the stands and stuff. And I remember crying because I didn't think I'd be able to read my music. And so my mom scheduled me a lesson uh, with some dude. I still don't know who it was. <laughs> it was just some dude in the area. Um who to help me learn my music. And I think I got a little bit better after that, but what really helped me was, um, he wasn't my section leader, but he was older than me. You know, he was a sophomore my freshman year. And he told me that I could count um, the, the, the rhythm that really flummoxed me was the dotted eighth, 16th tied to eighth, eighth rhythm, ba, 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 that one. Um, and he was just like, you know what? I know that rhythm is really scary, but you can just play it with a triplet if the, then make the last note short. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Sounds good. And so, um, that, that guy's name was David Berger and he is now a very well-known cantor, uh, in, in a synagogue. And, uh, so I thought I'd shout him out. Um, oh, that, I'd really appreciate the, uh, an opportunity to in, in interview him, that career that that's, that's precisely what I want to showcase is, you know, as a euphonium uh, artist, even if you uh, tend to put it down after high school, there is life after euphonium, regardless. I mean, even as an artist, you're going to retire at some point. You want to mm -hmm. move on or develop some other aspect of life. And uh, it'd be really amazing to, yeah, let's, let's, uh, if you're interested and if he's open to it, I would love to uh, be uh, be able to showcase uh, what he's doing. Yeah, and he his uh, he started on euphonium and then got into singing, whereas I started as a singer and got into euphonium. And so it's just it's just kind of an interesting kind of thing like that. But he helped me out a lot, and so that made me feel more excited about band. I loved marching band. You know, I came from junior high where it was just like a thing I did because I signed up for it. But in high school, I fell in love with it. Um, just being around the people and the marching, even though I'm really terrible at marching um, and uh, just playing in the stands, uh, going to football games. Uh, I just I, I really, really loved being a part of the marching band and even a part of the concert band. And so that made me want to practice. So that's um, that that was a big turning point for me it was my freshman year of high school. Freshman year. OK. And that would be a great uh, um kind of the wrap up to this mini way. And I think that would, uh, it leads really well into this, the next interview, this next conversation that we'll dive into uh, next uh, time on the International Euphonium Summit as this goes on. Um, Want to thank everyone for viewing. Uh, if any of this hit close to home, or as a parent, you can identify that smell um, or reminisce about that. I remember that blue juice smell. <laughs> um, and for those that are going through that transition of not knowing, you know, if you want to uh, pursue uh, baritone or euphonium in the seventh or the beginning years, uh, you don't know where you're at, stick with it. Leave a comment below. Let us know how we can help as a, a euphonium community. We're here to help you. I mean, that's why all this is free for you uh, that are listening and watching these lives, uh, these videos uh, stream across YouTube or, you know, Spotify or whatever media platform happens to be uh, free uh, forever. You know, it'd be really awesome to see how this has impacted uh, the future generations I want to thank you, Dr. Jamie Lipton, for jumping back into your childhood and talking about Care Bears and being flummoxed and and really uh, getting to get a grasp of your world as it is now, but as a young artist 
uh, starting to develop with the brass band world and seeing the opportunities just from that level. That that's that's just really remarkable. And uh, if you uh, don't know if there's a brass band near you, and you don't really have the resources to, resources to find out for some reason, leave a comment below. We'll see if you know one of us um, in the greater euphonium world can uh, help you out and locate those resources wherever you may be, um, wherever, wherever, literally wherever. Uh, yeah. So yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Jamie Lifton for joining us today and can't wait for next time. And uh, yeah, thanks for stopping by everyone and we'll talk soon. <laughs>